Okay. So here today with Gob Sheep and Small Brain, uh, a big, ba- big brain and a small brain. Well said. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so I uh, thought we would have a pretty informal, casual conversation. So I'll ask some questions, but feel free to really treat it as a conversation and we can riff off of each other. So maybe first for you, Small Brain. Um, I know that you've built a bunch of games over the last year and you've iterated on the technical stack for each of them. So I thought it would be interesting if you shared what each of those games was, how things evolved, what were some of the main things that you learned through that process? Yeah, sounds good. I can go through them quickly. So there have been, well, some number of games. One has been Words 3, which was like an on-chain version of Scrabble. Who played Words 3? Oh, cool, sweet. All right, amazing. Um, Another one was this game called Ape's Gambit, which was this like composable battle royale chess game. Then there was this game called Network States, which is actually playtesting out there in the games corner. Um, and Arb and Xerox Hank just presented about the lore in that one. And uh, most recently, this game called Draw Tech, which is this like mobile drawing on chain game. Um, and have, have learned a ton about like one, like just the things that are technically feasible in general on chain games right now. And two, like what that actually means in terms of if you want to ship something to mainnet, you know, within a reasonable period of time. Um, which, which are two very different things that I'm happy to get into. But yeah, that's the, that's the overview. Yeah, and maybe maybe we have some time here. So maybe to get into it a little bit. So between, say, Words 3 and Draw Tech, what, uh, maybe if you want to just talk through, like, what was the technical stack for Word, Word 3? What's yeah. the technical stack for Draw Tech? And what were some of the big things that you changed across the two of them? Yeah, that sounds great. So I think like the the technical stack for both was, uh, why don't we go bottom up? Um, I guess the bottom bottom is like Ethereum, but really like the chain both of them were launched on was an OP stack L2. So optimism mainnet or, and and base, um, yep, words three, the first round was an optimism mainnet. And then the second round was on base and then draw tech was on base. Um, And then on top of that, uh, solidity, but really mud. So... MUD was used to write the smart contracts. It's kind of like a Solidity library and associated client libraries that was used to bootstrap the client as well. And both were built in browser. So the, the browser, like all, all of that stuff was done with Phaser and React. And um, DrawTech was on mobile. So on top of that, there was Privy for good wallet onboarding and like a bunch of nice PWA hacks to get that to work. Um, actually, I, I'm really interested in this because Brian built Dark Forest earlier and so it, it will be really interesting to see like yeah i'd be interested to see like the difference in the stacks and the difference in like oh yeah very very different <laughs> yeah because layer two is you know I, the first version of dark forest was actually was it on mainnet it was on ropston okay. and uh following that i think from october 2020 onwards we were deployed on xdi which was a side chain that eventually became gnosis chain yeah um, how, how, maybe on this theme of L2s, um, how do you feel that the progression has been? Is it at the, is it kind of at an end state where you feel like you can build anything that you want or are you looking forward to it evolving further from here? Yeah. Um, I have a bunch of thoughts on this. So I think like, it's definitely not at an end state. There's like this weird trade off with L2s right now where, okay. So like side chains, just like a different consensus mechanism like a different chain totally with like some maybe some nice time to ethereum like i think polygon plus commitments to ethereum like every now and then um and like bridge bridging is nice and so that's just like a cheaper chain l2 is like most l2s right now that you can deploy to if you want to put stuff in mainnet except like arbitrum nova i think or nitro no nitros okay arbitrum nova i think uh you need to post all your call data to ethereum mainnet and so like this is really nice for some types of games which i don't have a lot of call data per transaction um, and kind of sucks for others. For example, like if your game has a lot of ZKPs in it, like probably Dark Forest, if you wanted to put it on L2, like ZKPs are probably like, you know, 200 bytes of call data. Like it's all the UNs in the ZKP. And now like you need to put all of these on Ethereum mainnet. Um, and so your, your gas costs are going to blow up. So I think like there's a lot of room for L2s that are friendly to that. Redstone, which literally was announced today, I think is a great example of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think like order of magnitude, couple of orders of magnitude, lower gas fees, and this like call data problem w- would make things a little bit nicer. Yeah, for sure. While we were building Dark Forest, I think at the time it felt like the idea of 
on-chain games was sufficiently far outside of the realm of possibility that we kind of just abstracted away the problem. Like, I remember at the time, the very first discussions around ZK rollups were starting to happen. Um, optimistic, we were, we were just starting to move from like plasma being kind of the dominant narrative for scaling into, into rollups and in particular optimistic rollups. Um, and at the time, we just sort of assumed like, okay, someone at this like lower level of abstraction will figure it out. Um, we're just going to build on top of like an interface boundary that we feel pretty comfortable is going to continue to exist um, as, a, as a fairly stable foundation. Uh, and that was the EVM. Um, so the goal with Dark Force was never really to actually build something that could in itself be an autonomous world like right then and there. Though we sort of like considered it and like did some back of the envelope math and like tried to figure out what that would take. But really more like present kind of a, uh, you know, a vision for like what everything above that level of the interface boundary could eventually look like. Like once everything below had the tools and the scalability and the developer experience uh, needs that uh, would actually enable like those levels of autonomy. But yeah, it's actually interesting, you know, speaking of Plasma, because I, I know that uh, Vitalik recently posted a blog post about, you know, the return of Plasma. We, we heard about the Redstone announcement earlier today. So it seems like this kind of spectrum of what is the level of data availability or other kinds of guarantee that you really need for something that is maybe lower stakes than a DeFi app, um, something like more gamified, uh, you know, exploring that trade-off is something that I think folks were, were kind of afraid to do for a couple of years, and now we're we're coming around to it now that we've got the application level motivation. Yeah, and and just as a heads up for folks, this was a technical feasibility panel, so we're going to get a little bit more technical. Um, maybe as a last question on this theme of layer twos, I I didn't catch the Redstone announcement, but uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe maybe in the ideal form, um, what would an L2 designed for on-chain games provide? Like what, what would you want from the point of view of a, a developer? Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, just going back to what we felt like we were really lacking back in 2020 versus what uh, was being optimized for that we, we did not need at the time. So we did not set out at the start to build a very financialized game, one that would necessarily need. Like I know that at the time there were sort of there were sort of two different directions going on with things that felt like games on chain. One was this idea of, you know, you take like a DeFi app or like a financialized app and you kind of skin it to be fun and like maybe there's like fruits or something or like, you know, the 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 swaps are like called something funny. Um and then the other direction that we were trying to push from was like, well, let's start with something that doesn't need really any financial security that might, you know, accrue different kinds of intrinsic value or like different kinds of like non-fungible value to the players themselves that can't easily be traded or transferred or put into a liquidity pool or whatever. Um, for the first kind of app, that was the the sort of app that I think was driving a lot of the, uh, um, you know, various kinds of pressures on the infrastructure and various kinds of like motivations on the infrastructure layer. And that's where you saw like a lot of the effort going into, um, you know, high data availability solutions, which you really do need if you're working on like a DeFi app that might be moving around like, you know, billions of dollars on the protocol. But for something like for something like a game, you know, the things that we needed were um, one, we needed it to be highly scalable. We needed the cryptographic integrity uh, and really the thing that I think we were getting the most mileage out of from EVM and like EVM tool chain ecosystem were composability and the ability for like by default developers can build on top by default developers can call into your smart contract API your game's digital physics however they want from any client from the terminal from whatever they can build other smart contracts on top that interoperate and this is something that I think you know it it inspired uh, a lot of what the composability elements we see today from from stuff like mud look like now um, and so a chain that's able to just like provide that very smoothly um, with the cryptographic integrity guarantees and again being maybe w a little bit more willing to trade off the hard data availability guarantees is, is something that uh, we would have you know I think really gotten a lot of mileage from with dark forest yeah that, that was a great answer um, I the only little thing that I will add to that is I think like it really depends on the game. For example, for words three games like words three and draw tech games that are about making only a like not a ton of moves 
but very meaningful moves and moves that have money associated with each one of them, existing L2s actually work great. Like I think that like lower gas fees, data availability abstracted away, like would be marginal improvements, um, may, may be worse because you want stronger security guarantees. Um, so it really depends on the game. Like some games you might want like an app chain with a bunch of pre-compiles in. Yeah, well, which, which doesn't exist yet. So I think like kind of going the other way, a lot of stuff that uh, is built is built for chains that can be put on mainnet right now. Makes sense. So maybe switching gears, I think uh, one of the things that games have a particular opportunity to play around with is this um, idea of public versus private state. And um, it's something that if you build something on the blockchain by default, the entire thing is transparent to all the every observer. Um, but we have an opportunity to use zero knowledge proofs and other te techniques to to kind of hide state. So maybe to you first, uh, I think Dark Forest was the first game that played around with this concept and you had a uh, cryptographic fog of war as people were exploring this universe. So maybe if you want to talk about how that construction worked at a high level in Dark Forest, and then I know that you know on the cryptography side, independent of autonomous worlds, you've been pushing a bunch of cryptography forward and you have this idea around cryptomata and uh, these kind of autonomous objects or worlds that can have private state. So also if you could talk about that and what you think would be possible today or in the near future. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll briefly mention the high level overview of the dark forest construction and what exactly zero knowledge is doing there. Um, one of the fundamental limitations of the blockchain, at least at its base level, um, sometimes a feature, sometimes a bug, is that it is a totally transparent data layer, um, which means that uh, there's a large class of games that you can't by default build on top of this kind of substrate. Um, in particular, uh, you know, in game theory, there's sort of a distinction between two types of games. There's complete information games and incomplete information games. Complete information games are games like chess or checkers where everyone can see the full state of the world. Whereas incomplete information games are games where information itself, there's information asymmetry and information itself becomes like a first class resource. So think about, you know, games like poker or Starcraft where there is a, a strategic element to what you're choosing to reveal or what your actions say about your private state that only you or a subset of the players might know. Now, Incomplete information games sort of definitionally are hard to build on a completely transparent data layer where everyone can see everything. But the other kind of problem is if you try to introduce the notion of private state without some more advanced cryptography onto the blockchain, there's no way to really tell that you are actually operating with your private state in accordance with the rules. Because in a smart contract, what the network is doing is it is looking at all of the state that you are providing to it and checking that that state and the transitions you're making on it are following the rules. So the high-level pattern with zero-knowledge proofs is that ZKPs become this way to hack incomplete information or information asymmetry onto such a public or transparent data layer. And like, you know, the high-level idea is, suppose I have a, a game like, let's say, chess, and it, I've got a piece in this chess game that's like a secret knight. You know, it's a knight that moves underground or something. Well, what I might do is, instead of moving my knight out in the open, if I wanted to have this kind of a secret knight whose location is only known to me, um, what I might do is I might commit the location of my knight <clears throat> at all points in time whenever I'm moving it. And then whenever I make a move with the knight, let's say from secret location A to secret location B, I'll publish hash commitments to A and B, as well as a zero-knowledge proof that says, I'm not going to tell you what locations A and B actually are, but here's a ZKP that there's like an L shape in between A and B. And so the network and any other players can verify, yes, um, you know, Gubsheep is following the rules, they're not teleporting their knight like all the way across the universe, but uh, they, you know, no one's going to be able to learn if this is a, you know, hiding or a, a blinding commitment, what the location of that knight actually is. Um, so, you know, there's this kind of interesting spectrum that you can start to draw around like, well, what kinds of private state, what kinds of information asymmetry can you introduce into blockchain games or games built on transparent data layers? And the first thing, you know, when we were initially sort of building the construction for Dark Forest, at first it seemed like, oh, you know, we're using this, this ZK construction, this very particular hacky way to hack, like, a specific kind of information asymmetry. You know, this idea of this very specific 
fog of war construction into this particular kind of game. But what we came to realize is that actually there's like this very general purpose thing going on here, this very like generic pattern, which is you can use zero knowledge proofs to introduce single player private state. That is private state in games where every single person has some sort of private information and they locally make updates on that. Um, there's other types of private state though, uh, or private interactions that you might care about, such as, you know, maybe I'm attacking you with a sword with some secret stats and you have a shield with some secret stats as well. And we want to jointly compute what is the outcome of, uh, you know, that sword attack on your shield without me learning, you know, more than I need to about your shield or you learning more than you need to about the sword. And that kind of thing you actually need more than zero knowledge for. That's, that's something that requires more advanced cryptography um, that we can't quite do today with the tools that we have on chain. But you can sort of see that there's this like, there's this increasing tower of the flexibility of incomplete information here. Yeah, um, I just have a little bit to add to that because I'm not super knowledgeable about this topic technically, but I can tell you like zero knowledge. Exactly. Zero I can't knowledge tell about you zero knowledge. The, the developer experience I would like, which is, I think we're getting closer to this world and that really excites me. Like it would be amazing to live in a world where in solidity or when you're writing mud, you can add macros that define certain things as private or not. That, that would be great. And like a lot of the, the zero knowledge proof stuff is abstracted away from you. I also think like we're getting to a point where we can do programmable stuff. Like I can write programs and have the cryptography be abstracted away from me. And this like just allows me as a developer to build more tools like this and build more functionality like this into a game. Um, and then the other thing I'm really excited about is like UX problems around private state solutions to be solved. I think a lot of this is like proving time going down. I think a lot of this is like avoiding things like having slashing in your protocol or like having, you know, needing two players to be live to do that sort of sword shield um, fighting in your protocol, things like that. Like when all of those are solved, I think we're, we're getting close to that. I think we'll be able to build really crazy stuff on Jade. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it, there's really an interesting loop between like the strength of your cryptography and how seamless you can make the end user experience. So for example, like, you know, to go back to that sword and shield example, um, if I am, you know, live, like online on the game right now, and Sohan is online on the game, and we have what's called multi-party computation or collaborative snarks, what we can do is we can do this sort of battle where I've got some secret stats, Sohan's got some secret stats, and we determine, you know, what's the outcome of my attack, or what's the outcome of this, this battle jointly without revealing our respective private states to each other or to the world. Um, however, uh, the thing that you can't do, even if you have that level of cryptography, which is, you know, sort of a, a strictly harder node on the cryptography tech tree than ZK Snarks alone, the thing you still can't do is like, I can't set something like, you know, a mouse trap or like some sort of hidden trap in the, uh, you know, star system where my base is stationed. And if someone like happens to pass by that star system, that secret trap activates. That's something that requires even more powerful cryptography. And, you know, there's a very direct like affordance match to every successive rung of the technology ladder that you can assess. So we've got something like a 50 year future here, I think, ahead of us for getting fully on chain games that can replicate exactly everything uh, that can be done today with trusted servers. So maybe Sohan, riffing off of that, a question for you is, I think you know you've you've built a number of games over the last year, and you've had a tight feedback loop bit between you know having an idea, thinking about what's theoretically possible and what can actually be built today. So when you think about what is you know what is what sorts of games are possible to build on the blockchain as a substrate at the limit, what comes to mind for you? And then how does that map to, you know, what can be built as a, say, tech demo today? And then what can be practically built and used by normal people, you know, as a real game that they, say, play on their phone? Yeah. Um, where would you draw the lines between each of those with where we're at today? Yeah, great question. Um, one that I run into a lot, right? And I think I can, I can, I'll start the other way around. I'll start with, like, what are the constraints where, like, this game is axed if, it breaks one of these constraints and it wants to be shipped in like a month. And those are still really high. I mean, I think like it probably needs to be deployed on an L2 where all the call data is posted. 
So like large call data costs probably can't work. Another thing like non-constant time computation per transaction is an instant ax for me. And like, that's a pretty like low bar, right? Um, but th there's just like a lot of risk that comes with that. If you have non-constant time computation, somebody builds a structure that's too complicated, your game is bricked for everyone. And like, this is something that's, that's really basic, but still like, if you're looking to launch something on mainnet in a short time period right now, it feels better to avoid. What's an example of that? Oh yeah, this, an example of that is like uh, any sort of lazy updating. So if you have, uh, sorry, like not any sort of lazy updating, you can do constant time lazy updating, which is what like I strive to do, but uh, lazy updating where let's say like you have a game where in network states you get like a troop a second. Um, what you want to do is, you know, you don't like add, there's no tick on an L2, so you can't add a troop to everybody a second. So what you do is you like, when the next person makes a transaction, you see how many seconds it's been, you give them the right amount of troops. Fine, you can do this in constant time. You subtract the block number, you add the number of troops. Now, let's say you want to do something where like you get a number of troops based on what else is happening in the game or based on your current number of troops. Now what you need to do is you need to like have your tick function, like look at my number of troops, figure out how much to add, and you need to run that for the number, like for every block that it's been. Um, so now like what happens then if you implement this and somebody makes a move after like a thousand blocks or like a million blocks is like that transaction will never go through because it's looping too much and it's like going to pass the block gas limit. And so like now your game is bricked. So now what you need to do here is that you need to do some calculus to like figure out what that rate of increase would be and then, then do the lazy update. But you can see how like lazy updates can get really complicated if they depend on other things in the state. And then now your like computation blows up. Um, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this because Dark Forest had, had a lot of these problems as well. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, there's many things you can't do on chain. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think what, where to even start. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have kind of a funny, uh, like, example of emergent behavior that came out of this constraint, actually, of the the lazy updating problem. So, with Dark Forest, um, as folks know, one of the things you can't do on a blockchain is you cannot schedule an event to run for later. Um, but we wanted to make it such that in Dark Forest, you could send a spaceship or like some resources from planet A to planet B and have that actually take time. You know, it might take like 100 seconds or like, you know, an hour to move these resource to ferry these resources around. Um, and just like Sohan mentioned, the trick there is you basically have to like schedule that arrival such that the next time that destination planet is interacted with, you check whether or not you're past the time of that arrival. And if so, you basically like land the arrival. So you're sort of doing this like optimistic kind of calculation. Well, the problem is if you've got like 100 incoming arrivals to a planet, then what's going to happen is that uh, you're going to have to basically like land 100 arrivals the next time that planet is interacted with. So you have to find out like, well, what's the upper limit of where like, you know, RPC endpoints will like reasonably accept you to put like a gas limit of this and land like so and so many arrivals. And we settled on the number of seven. So any planet at a given time can have seven ships coming into it. But what that led to was like players figured this out. You know, they like infected the code and they also would run into things when they would try to send that eighth arrival. So they would do this thing where it's like if you had uh, it was called like planet DOS, planet denial of service. So if you had like some really key strategic location uh, that like was being contested, you would make sure that there were always like eight you know, arrivals coming in from either you or a collaborator who was like nearby uh, so that no, no one who was trying to take that key strategic location would be able to like slip their transaction in. So it's almost like a MEV style kind of thinking. Um, so yeah, the lazy updating thing is, is pretty interesting. It leads to both like constraints as well as emergent behavior, which I think is always like a theme in, in game development. Um, echoing for sure the, the like large gas cost thing. We sort of always knew like, okay, it's just not possible to have a dark forest round running with more than like 2000 concurrent players. Um, that was just like, that was just like a ceiling. And we were like, okay, we we're like just fundamentally limited by this technology until the underlying thing like changes somehow that go going back to our discussion on L2s. Cool. Um, oh, actually I will add one more. This is sort of an extension off of lazy updating, but, uh, hooks are a really interesting one that oftentimes you want actions in games where you can set some sort of trigger for like, okay, you know, if I move on to this tile like then activate all of the different you know traps that have been placed on that tile 
or all of the different, uh, you know, like there's some sort of mechanic that like someone else should be able to hook that tile into. And again, you can't just like, it seems like being able to put arbitrary logic or functionality on that tile is something that you would be able to, you would expect as a player, but you sort of, you know, have to limit this. It has to like bottom out somehow. And there's certain, certain types of hooks that are just like not even possible at all due to the various like issues with permissions models and stuff like that on the blockchain. Yeah. I could, I could actually, like, I'm thinking of more things now. Um, but this, one, this one's a really... Let's keep shitting on the blockchain. Yeah, yeah I know. Could go on. Um, but this, this was a really interesting technical tidbit, which is, like, with lazy updates, if you have, like, some continuous function, um, but your lazy updates need to be discrete, like, for example, your troops, grow, like, your troops grow over time, like, your population grows over time on some curve, but, like, you can't have half a person at a, at a tile in your game. Um, you need to store wads which is like how you store like floating like decimals on chain um you like i find myself doing this a lot you need to store a wad count and a discrete count for almost everything you're lazy updating um which is really annoying and comes up a lot just because otherwise people can choose when they lazy update things to to mess with the discreteness to either get more or less than than what they should have and that can be meaningful later in the game um so l lots of annoying things with lazy updates Cool. Maybe one more question, and then we can open it up for some Q and A. Um, so riffing off of an, on this uh, point of planet denial of service, um, another thing that's unique about building on-chain games is that you know with a normal game, you expect players of your game to try to uh, misuse the game, like find any kind of advantages and hacks that they can, but their only point of entry is the front end that you give them. And ultimately you control the game engine and, um, and you can, you know, you can allow or disallow certain things from happening. But in the case of on-chain games, the entire engine itself is, is open. Uh, the code can be read and you can't really distinguish between what's a, you know, human player or what's a bot. Uh, and so you're operating in a kind of adversarial environment. So maybe Brian, if you want to first talk about, you know, what you've learned from building a game in that kind of an environment. Yeah, this was a really interesting constraint um, from the very beginning. And I think that, again, like we've mentioned previously, um, a lot of times constraints will, constraints will like breed creativity or breed different kinds of emergence. And you just sort of have to design around them and you might find something unexpected and interesting. So uh, one thing that we wanted to do from the very start with Dark Forest was we wanted to make it such that it was not a game that you could, you could Sybil attack. Uh, because in this world where anyone can spin up an Ethereum address and where you can't necessarily know whether like an address maps to a particular person, or maybe you don't even want to know if an address maps to a person. You want, to be this, you want for this to be a game that's like friendly to player corporations or bots or whatever else. Um, you need to somehow like design the game around like, uh, you know, these sort of continuous progression, these continuous like linear or exponential progression uh, curves that are somehow like time agnostic. So the way that we designed Dark Forest to have this flavor of progression was um, the game was very like exponential in, in nature. Uh, and what would happen was you would not be able to get uh, an edge by capturing like a larger amount of small planets with a bunch of, you know, newly instantiated accounts, like that amount of effort that you could put in would be like equally well spent coordinating your resources on like one big account trying to take like one big planet. So we would have basically these like scale factors and we would try to estimate like, okay, at a certain hash rate and at a certain player activity level, like what would be the time for a player to have like an empire of this size? And how do we make it such that, you know, with that same amount of like action expenditure, that's like going to be approximately equal in strength and resource count to, you know, putting your resources towards the alternate strategy of like, you know, farming a bunch of small planets or something. And this was like a very, very rough calculus, but it did work for approximately like the first like two weeks of the progression curve. And that's about exactly how long a like dark forest round lasts. And people would find ways to hack around that. But I thought that was super interesting. Later on, about like a year and a half in, we had actually built up enough, an, enough of an identity set, though, around the game. Like, uh, you know, what I mean by identity set is like there had been enough activity on previous rounds of Dark Forest that we had this very rudimentary like proof of 
personhood, like proof of work sort of thing, like we knew that these addresses were real people, um, that we were able to start introducing mechanics that broke this uh, anti cybel kind of principle. So now, you know, as of the, the last Dark Forest round, um, Dark Forest V0.6, uh, there is this thing introduced where, like, you know, if you spin up a new account, you automatically get some starting resources. And we felt comfortable and safe to do that because we had this set of basically you had to uh, you had to prove that you had, you know, achieved some sort of rank or something in a previous Dark Forest round to be able to do that. And then we'd also give you like one or two additional gameplay keys to distribute to friends. Um, and that was like a nice, like emergent kind of thing that happened that was super interesting. That, that is really interesting. I'd love to dig more into that in a second. Um, but Sib Sybil is something I think about a ton because it breaks your game if, if you know, easily Sybil attackable. The one rule I keep in my mind when designing something is it should never be advantageous at any point in play to stop playing with your wallet and create another one and play with that one. Like, at, at worst, it should be, like, equal to do that. And then you're fine. And this is like something I try to think about at every stage of the game when it's being built. And I think as long as you meet this rule, you're okay. Um, what that actually looks like in practice is it means you make decisions like this. Like, for example, let's say you're making a game and your game, like people are doing something. And at the beginning, they buy in with some money. And at the end, if they play well, they get some money back. Like this, this is high level what your game is. And let's say like you sit down and you're like, okay, a reasonable way to do this is everybody's gonna buy in for $5, and then the top half of players are going to double their money if they win, and the bottom half will get nothing. Or the top 10 players will like, you know, whatever, like make all the, like split the entire pot in 10 ways and nobody else will win. And this is like not gonna work. This is a terrible idea to do on chain, simply because now if you're player number one, instead of continuing to be player number one, you're immediately going to spin up an address and try to be player number two. Like you want to control the most number of spots on the leaderboard. And so there is, there's like some theoretical point where like it might be better for somebody to stop playing from the wallet they're playing in and spin up a new one and play from that. And so like this is not a great game to put on chain. Um, actually, maybe, maybe it's not like not a great game to put on chain. Maybe they're like interesting things you do with identity. Like I'm not saying there aren't ways to solve this problem. I'm saying that like now you have to think about this problem and solve it. Um, so that, that's like, yeah, so, so that's, that's like the rule I keep in mind. And it ends up looking like instead of giving the money to the top 10 people, what you want to do is you want to like give it by percentage of points. So now like whether I earn a point from one wallet or another, it's just going to get split by percentage. It doesn't really matter. It's probably just slightly better for me to play from the same wallet. So like my name stays the same on the leaderboard. Um, that, that's kind of how I think about civil stuff. You know, if you don't mind me asking Sohan a question here, I'm curious for you, like, how would you distill down, why is it the case, like, theoretically, you could imagine that these similar kinds of concerns would exist in, you know, traditional games, like, you know, traditional mobile games, like anything with the leaderboard. Why is this problem, uh, like, we have this vague sense that, like, oh, yeah, the, the blockchain is, like, more adversarial, but can you break down, like, exactly what are the points in which that adversarial nature comes in where this sort of concern is much more like accentuated in a blockchain or an on-chain game versus yeah um I, I mean i just think it, i think like it's money right uh you you feel it a lot with money if games are being deployed on an l2 now because of gas costs if they've like game or if they are games of reasonable mm -hmm. complexity there probably needs to be some money involved to justify gas costs i don't think like this is a good constraint to build games under actually and even some things i work on like don't meet this constraint but assuming like we're in the world of games that do, um, then I think like if you're number one on that top 10 leaderboard, top 10 in the leaderboard getting hit out situation I talked about, like you immediately feel that you should move to a new wallet and play to claim more cash on, on, on number two. Um, if they're like in-game rewards that are, that are fake, maybe you feel that less strongly. Um, but I think like you just immediately do the obvious thing in that situation and, and the feeling's lost. Yeah, actually, that also, like, uh, that jumping off of that, like, I have two other thoughts on this that that's kind of inspiring. Um, another thing that's pretty interesting is that there is sort of this, like, social expectation that 
blockchain is an adversarial environment, which like makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like when you build something for a blockchain, it just happens to be you're going to be building it for a bunch of devs who also have this like social expectation of credible neutrality, who are going to be like digging into the code and like trying to break it. And that, that doesn't necessarily exist for most, you know, game audiences. And that's actually something that's like you can entirely factor out from the technical component. Um, just like, again, what, what is the common expectation here culturally? Um, and then I guess, yeah, there's there's another one which is like, okay, if you factor that out, what's left, there's another technical component, which I feel is even orthogonal to the financial thing of you can't really gate things behind. You, you don't have as many bottlenecks to gate player activity. Uh, for example, you can't put a, you can't just put up a CAPTCHA on the web client you provide Log because, Twitter, like, yeah. right, right. Cause people will find another way to just talk to the smart contracts, like due to that permissionless sort of nature. So totally. Yeah. Um, well, 100%, it's just like super cheap to create a new address right and then then another thing that that like brings up is like we're making games like games i do believe in what kushaba said earlier today if any of you were at that talk like games should be fun for people and going back to your first question like bots and people playing together is one thing i think about a lot because if you have games that are persistent and infinite and lasting forever like people are and if money involved like people are going to make bots for them so then it's like how do you design a game where there are some strategies which are better for people who jump into the game maybe for like 15 minutes on a Friday night can go in and like do something fun and interesting in the game. And at the same time, there are like other strategies which are better for bots to play like a long term on a way more long term scale. Um, and even like like bot like people assisted with bots, like the spectrum of like humans and bots to like session time. Like how can you make a game that's equally fun across all of these? is I think a, a really, really interesting problem. I'm gonna add maybe one more thing. I'll toss in one more counterpoint to all the stuff that we've been saying here before handing it back to Sina. Um, there is a very interesting thing that happened though uh, once Dark Forest got past a certain level of sort of community continuity, which was that in the very last round of Dark Forest V0.6, there was this very interesting controversy over something that was like arguably an exploit slash like not completely intended game behavior, but which was obeying the laws of the of, of the game um, <clears throat> that allowed uh, DFDAO, which was a collection of players from all over the world, uh, to basically, you know, upset the reigning champs, Orden GG, which was a player group from Eastern Europe. And uh, the really interesting thing about this story was that you'd sort of expect in a world where it's all adversarial, you know, people are just going for first place or like the highest percentage of like whatever the, the metaphorical prize pool is, you just sort of like gun for first. But what ended up happening was there was this like super interesting back and forth between DF Dow and Orden GG, which actually resulted in the both of them agreeing to a diplomatic draw where they, you know, each reached, you know, some threshold of points and agreed not to score any more points for like the remainder of the round. And that was due to basically like, you know, this sort of like multidimensional negotiation uh, between them where they recognize oh, we're like playing this sort of infinite game. We don't want to do things that are going to like piss off the rest of the player base. Uh, and we want to, you know, like actually the thing that's going to instill more of a feeling of credible neutrality within this game community, which has evolved into being something much more than the set of just smart contracts, is to do this out of bound, uh, out of band social protocol. So here we saw that like aliveness of the social community was bootstrapped by these, uh, you know, a autonomous worlds technologies. But the goal was never to build a purely technological autonomous world. It was to build a social system, and that I think was an interesting threshold to cross over. And it reminds me of a lot of the stuff that Hilmar says about Eve as this sort of like, you know, this engine or this machine for storytelling and lore like all of that stuff is based off of the relationships between players and i think it's important not to lose sight of like we do all of this stuff so we can get to a point where a lot of that social coordination and dynamics can take over awesome uh so i think that brings us to the end of our panel uh thank you gup sheep and small brain uh uh, notes for the unconference tomorrow. Each panel is meant to leave you with a question to potentially talk through. So this has been a panel about technical fe feasibility of games. And the question is, fast forward three years, we're back at another Autonomous Worlds gathering, and there are a number of playtests dropping today. In what way are those games different than the games that were here today? 
and uh, thank you again.